Decline of the English Murder by George Orwell, first published in 1946. It is Sunday afternoon, preferably before the war. The wife is already asleep in the armchair and the children will be sent out for a nice long walk. You put your feet up on the sofa, settle your spectacles on your nose and open the news of the world. Roast beef in Yorkshire or roast pork and apple sauce, followed up by suet pudding and driven home, as it were, by a cup of mahogany brown tea, have put you in just the right mood. Your pipe is drawing sweetly, the sofa cushions are soft underneath you, the fire is well alit, the air is warm and stagnant. In these blissful circumstances, what is it that you want to read about? Naturally, about a murder. But what kind of murder? If one examines the murders which have been given the greatest amount of pleasure to the British public, the murders whose story is known in its general outline to almost everyone, and which have made it into novels and rehashed over and over again by the Sunday papers, one finds a fairly strong family resemblance running through the greater number of them. Our great period in murder, our Elizabethan period so to speak, seems to have been between roughly 1850 and 1925, and the murderers whose reputation has stood the test of time are the following. Dr Palmer of Rudgley, Jack the Ripper, Neil Cream, Mrs Maybrick, Dr Crippin, Seddon, Joseph Smith, Armstrong and Bywaters and Thompson. In addition, in 1919 or thereabouts, there was another very celebrated case which fits into the general pattern, but which I had better not mention by name, because the accused man was acquitted. Of the above-mentioned nine cases, at least four have had successful novels based on them. One has been made into a popular melodrama, and the amount of literature surrounding them, in the form of newspaper write-ups, criminological treaties and reminiscences by lawyers and police officers, would make a considerable library. It is difficult to believe that any recent English crime will be remembered so long and so intimately, and not only because the violence of external events has made murder seem unimportant, but because the prevalent type of crime seems to be changing. The principal call celeb of the war years was the so-called cleft chin murder, which has now been written up in a popular booklet. The verbatim account of the trial was published some time last year by Messrs. Jarobs with an introduction by Mr. Beshaloff Roberts before returning to this pitiful and sordid case, which is only interesting from a sociological and perhaps a legal point of view, let me try to define what it is that the readers of Sunday papers mean when they say fretfully that you never seem to get a good murder nowadays. In considering the nine murders I named above, one can start by excluding the Jack the Ripper case, which is in a class by itself. Of the other eight, six were poisoning cases, and eight of the ten criminals belonged to the middle class. In one way or another, sex was a powerful motive in all but two cases, and in at least four cases, respectively, the desire to gain a secure position in life, or not to forfeit one's social position by some scandal such as divorce, was one of the main reasons for committing murder. In more than half the cases, the object was to get hold of a certain known sum of money, such as a legacy or an insurance policy, but the amount involved was nearly always small. In most of the cases, the crime only came to light slowly as the result of careful investigations which started off with the suspicions of neighbours or relatives, and in nearly every case there was some dramatic coincidence in which the finger of providence could be clearly seen, or one of those episodes that no novelist would dare to make up, such as Crippin's flight across the Atlantic with his mistress dressed as a boy, or Joseph Smith playing Nearer My God to Thee on the harmonium while one of his wives was drowning in the next room. The background of all these crimes, except Neil Creams, was essentially domestic. Of twelve victims, seven were either wife or husband of the murderer. With all this in mind, one can construct what would be, from a News of the World reader's point of view, the perfect murder. The murderer should be a little man of the professional class, a dentist or a solicitor, say, living an intensely respectable life somewhere in the suburbs, and preferably in a semi-detached house which will allow the neighbours to hear suspicious sounds through the wall. He should be either chairman of the local Conservative Party branch or a leading nonconformist and strong temperance advocate. 
he should go astray through cherishing a guilty passion for his secretary or the wife of a rival professional man, and should only bring himself to the point of murder after long and terrible wrestles with his conscience. Having decided on murder, he should plan it all with the utmost cunning and only slip up over some tiny unforeseeable detail. The means chosen should, of course, be poison. In the last analysis, he should commit murder because this seems to him less disgraceful and less damaging to his career than being detected in adultery. With this kind of background, a crime can have dramatic and tragic qualities which make it memorable and excite pity for both victim and murderer. Most of the cases mentioned above have a touch of this atmosphere, and in three cases, including the one I have referred to but did not name, the story approximates to the one I have outlined. Now compare the cleft chin murder. There is no depth of feeling in it. It was almost chance that the two people concerned committed that particular murder, and it was only by good luck that they did not commit several others. The background was not domesticity, but the anonymous life of the dance halls and the false values of the American film. The two culprits were an 18-year-old ex-waitress named Elizabeth Jones, and an American army deserter posing as an officer named Carl Hulton. They were only together for six days, and it seems doubtful whether, until they were arrested, they even learned one another's true names. They met casually in a tea shop, and that night went out for a ride in a stolen army truck. Jones described herself as a striptease artist, which was not strictly true. She had given one unsuccessful performance in this line, and declared that she wanted to do something dangerous, like being a gun mole. Holton described himself as a big-time Chicago gangster, which was also untrue. They met a girl bicycling along the road, and to show how tough he was, Holton ran over her with his truck, after which the pair robbed her of the few shillings that were on her. On another occasion, they knocked out a girl to whom they had offered a lift, took her coat and handbag, and threw her into a river. Finally, in the most wanton way, they murdered a taxi driver who happened to have eight pounds in his pocket. Soon afterwards they parted. Holton was caught because he had foolishly kept the dead man's car, and Jones made spontaneous confessions to the police. In court, each prisoner incriminated the other. In between crimes, both of them seemed to have behaved with the utmost callousness. They spent the dead taxi driver's eight pounds at the dog races. Judging from her letters, the girl's case has a certain amount of psychological interest, but this murder probably captured the headlines because it provided distraction amid the doodlebugs and the anxieties of the Battle of France. Jones and Holton committed their murder to the tune of V1 and were convicted to the tune of V2s. There was also considerable excitement because, as has become usual in England, the man was sentenced to death and the girl to imprisonment. According to Mr Raymond, the reprieving of Jones caused widespread indignation and streams of telegrams to the Home Secretary. In her native town, she should hang was chalked on the walls beside pictures of a figure dangling from a gallows. Considering that only ten women have been hanged in Britain this century, and that the practice has gone out largely because of popular feeling against it, it is difficult not to feel that this clamour to hang an 18-year-old girl was due partly to the brutalising effects of war. Indeed, the whole meaningless story, with its atmosphere of dance halls, movie palaces, cheap perfume, false names and stolen cars, belongs essentially to a war period. Perhaps it is significant that the most talked of English murder of recent years should have been committed by an American and an English girl who had become partly Americanized. but it is difficult to believe that this case will be so long remembered as the old domestic poisoning dramas, product of a stable society where the all-prevailing hypocrisy did at least ensure that crimes as serious as murder should have strong emotions behind them.